project. MICI project stands for Moreland Indicators of Climate Change Initiative and it's a project that allows young people who live around the Peak District to have access to the research that's going on on climate change on their moorlands. With the help of the Economic and Social Research Council and Moors for the Future, uh, learning and discovery officers from the Peak District National Park have enabled young people to go out on the moorlands every March and do a health check to see whether the moorlands are in a good state of health from a climate change point of view. It's really important in places like the Peak District where we're surrounded by lots of urban communities so people uh, feel a real passion for the place and can get really involved and that's what the Mickey project has been about. Um, thanks to the help of the Economic and Social Research Council and the Peak District National Park Authority and people like Moors of the Future, that research is, is out there and is going on and our role is to really get young people and other people involved in that research and understanding what the issues are and why they're important and how they can get involved in the research. Why do you think research into moorland issues might be important for the future? There are a huge number of changes which are happening in moorland environments that we need to understand and for which research is really crucial. Moorland environments are changing, not only due to climate change, uh, there's demographic change, the populations that live in these environments are changing, uh, cultural change, the ways in which we perceive and interact with these environments are changing, our views of these landscapes are changing. Uh, and in addition to that, we've got economic drivers, uh, changes, for example, in the subsidies that uh, farmers and other land managers receive from the EU and huge policy changes which are taking place at the moment. We need to understand what all these changes will mean for moorlands and the unpredictable ways in which they might interact with one another. Uh, these are unpredictable times and the ways in which uh, the environment interacts with these social and economic issues uh, may be very unpredictable and the consequences of that may be very important for us as a society. UK peatlands are extremely important for climate change because they are our biggest carbon store in the UK. Although they cover only 10% of the UK area, they store 3 billion tonnes of carbon, which is around the same, like 20 times the carbon stored in the forests of the UK. If we lose only 5% of that carbon, that will be the annual emissions of the people in the UK. And this would add to greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a special responsibility to protect peatlands so that they can store the carbon and sequester the carbon, so continue to fix carbon. But if da uh, peatlands are damaged, they become a liability and they lose carbon to the atmosphere. And uh, for example, under climate change, we expect uh, drying conditions and this can uh, exacerbate the uh, carbon flux from, uh, from peatlands, deteriorate water quality and uh, make, them, make the peatlands more susceptible for wildfire. It's not just about doing more and better science, uh, pure science, natural science. It's also about doing more and better social science uh, and uh, combined uh, interdisciplinary science. Uh, we need to understand the views of the people who live in and work in these environments and the people who visit these environments and interact with them in various different ways. Uh, how do these people's perceptions uh, matter? How are they changing? And how are these people likely to interact with these environments in future? What can we do to change the ways in which people interact with these environments to ensure that we all treasure and manage these environments as sustainably as possible in future? Um, one of the busiest time of years for the monitoring team is to um, get the vegetation monitoring done. Um, we've got a very tight window between the end of bird nesting season and the start of the grass shooting season. And so we have to really get on and um, look at what vegetation there is on the more life sites. Um, the reason we're doing this is because the restoration works involve um, a large amount of revegetation work. Um, so they're spreading the lime seed and the fertiliser on bare peat areas um, with the intention of um, bringing vegetation back to those surfaces. And so we set up monitoring quadrats. Um, these are basically squares of two metres by two metres they're fixed in the ground with um, two wooden stakes and we come back to that point year after year to basically see how well the bare peat's revegetating but also to look at the succession of um, nurse crop to moorland vegetation. 
we've got going on for about 200 of these quadrats on Bleaklow. Um, similar, well, about 50, 60 quadrats up on Black Hill and Turley Halls and Rishworth going on for about 150 quadrats between them. So it's a really extensive operation and it's a really important part of feeding back to the Conservation Works team how well the vegetation is taking a hold on the Bear Peak. And so we've got teams of research assistants who are out doing this with the help of volunteers and they work in all weathers as you can see. It's, it's the height of summer at the moment and this is the sorts of conditions that they're working in and uh, making quite good progress. So it's going well. Moorland, I think it's the most beautiful, beautiful environment. I feel emotionally attached to it, I feel personally attached to it, and I have to say I have a family attachment to it. And I look at Moorland, um, I have a small grouse moor um, and an adjacent farm, and I hold it in trust. I held it in trust for future generations, both of my family and the populace at large. It's a resource that's uh, of course, valuable from the point of view of uh, storing carbon. It's a valuable resource for biodiversity, a range of bird life, uh, and a range of economic ac activities as well. Moorland is a very important term for me. It's a place where I work as a scientist. Moorland is, a, I guess, a, a, a wet environment predominantly, dominated by uh, peatlands or heaths, and very important for the carbon cycle in the UK. To me, moorlands mean more than that though. Not only a place to work as a scientist, but a place uh, that is ever changing. Every day, every moment of every day, the colours, the aspect, the vista changes as the weather changes, as seasons change and so on. Well, Moorlands have always been pretty special to me, even since I was a teenager really. I used to live on the um, west side of the Peak District and we used to come across to Edale, usually by train, and go walking in the moors. And I suppose it's about being in that sort of wilder type landscape, a bit different from the norm for most people, um, where you see a lot of wildlife, you get really expansive landscapes, there's a lot of beauty to it. So from that side, that's probably where I came into it, but now of course from a sort of professional point of view I see all the other benefits, so we, we're doing you know, huge amounts in the trust with biodiversity conservation, providing a whole range of different access opportunities for people, whether they're walkers or cyclists or paragliders or whatever. So a huge range of good opportunities. And also other things like water quality. So a lot of what we, the water we drink, most of the water we drink actually in this country comes from upland areas like the Peak District. So you live in Manchester or Sheffield or Nottingham, you might be drinking Peak District water. So the way we look after these moors is really important, important for that as well. So there's a whole raft of you know, values that you can put on the moors. Who does the peat belong to anyway? Peat belongs to the peak district. You can walk over it as it's public land. However, you should respect it. These are our responsibilities to look after the moorland and protect it just because we live on this planet and we should respect it. We should care about what happens in the moorlands because like in the future we could get resources from there uh, and if we just like abandon it now uh, and what be suitable to use in the future. Moorland could be valuable for the future as a source of fuel and energy supply. Yeah, it's very pretty here, isn't it? Yeah, and it's um, interesting how it can be so different in a small area. Yeah, and like acidity and different plant, that's plants yeah, that grow. Yeah, the different species of plant. Yeah, and it's diff like different to, where we, to the town. Yeah, it's Ipswich, because you feel like in your middle of nowhere. And it's like, feels so fresh. 
Well, in the Peak District as in much of the rest of the UK, the majority of the peat uh, belongs to private landowners, but there are a number of other substantial landowners, for example, uh, water companies, uh, national trusts, RSPB, NGOs such as those. And immediately that begins to, to tell you that this uh, peat is a resource which means many things to many people. This is something which uh, people used to earn their livelihoods from. Uh, farmers, grass moor owners, for example, who are using this as a resource to grow a crop, to earn an income, to feed their families. At the same time, this same land is Britain's most important source of drinking water. 70% of our drinking water in this country comes from mainly upland peaty catchments. Uh, at the same time, this uh, also is uh, really important for conservation. Many species and habitats that exist nowhere else in the world exist on these peatlands and we need to protect them. The real answer to this is that the peat, the peat belongs to all of us. Uh, UK society as a whole depends on our peatlands for many, many important services that we cannot live without. How can we keep our peat soils in good health for the future? Raise awareness of why the moors are special and encourage responsible use to care for landscape. Restore and conserve important recreation and nature moorland resources. I think the first thing we have to remember is that most of the moorland we have is either a site of special scientific interest or as an area of special protection. So we've not done bad so far. But I'd, I'd be very cautious about making any sudden change. Particularly, I'd be very cautious about government intervention because the his history of government intervention has been, frankly, counterproductive. Go back 50, 60 years when there were grants to drain moorland and now, of course, there are grants to block grips up again. Rising temperatures are leading to droughts. A drought is lack of water vapour in the air. Britain experiences droughts every five to ten years. The southeast is often the worst affected area. There are two types of drought. Meteorological, which is no rain over a short period, and hydrological, which is little rain over a long period. In 2010 and the first half of 2011, climate change was responsible for mass snowfall and rainfall in the Rocky Mountains and across the Midwest, which led to record flooding along the Mississippi River. Wetlands are vital in Britain. They are an important part in the regulation of river flow. They filter pollution and are spawning zones for fish. They are crucial for stopping flooding. They act like a sponge and soak up the water, which reduces flooding. Extreme weather can also have a damaging effect on habitats. Wetlands both for bad weather associated with climate change. In the future, we aim to supply most of the population with sufficient energy resources. These resources are as follows. Wind turbines convert kinetic energy of wind into electrical energy. Solar power, the sun can generate energy via nuclear fusion. Hydroelectric power can be generated by water running down mountains. Also, the tide provides reliable and plentiful energy that could provide 20% of Britain's energy. The problems of extremely wet winters. The UK has experienced many heavy floods over the past decade, which has affected thousands of people and has caused millions of pounds worth of damage. Rainfall in June July 2007 was almost 20% higher than ever seen. Climate change has made Britain a hotspot for flooding, which, in, which will risk their lives and damage property over the next century. Now we wish to talk about future transport in the greener way. At the moment, new types of fuels are being devised to help reduce the effects of, high, of greenhouse gases produced by burning hydrocarbons. Electric cars don't produce CO2 or any other harmful gases. Hydrogen vehicles use hydrogen as an alternative fuel source, which is a lot cleaner than current vehicles. This concludes our video by the Longington School. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
which means crops will not survive in that sort of condition. Because the moorlands are full of peat and when the peat burns it releases CO2 into the atmosphere and that can add to the greenhouse effect. Climate change might affect the water cycle in moorland environments in a number of ways. Firstly, it might affect rainfall uh, and snow. Snow is very important in upland environments and the way in which snow falls and how it melts periodically during the winter is important. Now climate change might mean that the duration and intensity of snow and snow melt events changes and that might change flood risk downstream. But it might also mean that in the summer there could be more prolonged drought periods and that would mean severe problems for water resource management. We know that our upland environments, particularly dominated by peat, have very flashy river flow regimes. What this means is that the water levels rise and fall very quickly on our rivers after rainfall. Now, if you have periods without rain that last a long time, that means the river levels remain low for a long time. And given that 70% of the water resource in the UK comes from our uplands, if we have drought for just a few weeks in our upland environments, this puts our water resources under severe stress. Dry weather in the summer with warmer weather also means that the peat dries out and that can release a lot more carbon not only into the atmosphere but into our water as well. And that carbon makes our water very brown and more difficult and expensive to treat before we can drink it. If you thought about our moorlands in the future, what would be your vision? The current year is 2020. These days we save a lot of energy on our homes using the methods which we suggested in our A-levels. How times have changed. We use low energy light bulbs and our lights have controls that automatically turn them off when the light, natural light levels rise. The biggest change is that we now have mandatory energy meters in our homes which measure our weekly energy, electricity and gas use. If we exceed a certain level, then the energy police come a-knocking. I've experienced this once before. It was scary. The East Coast wind farms now complete. We can now see hundreds of thousands of wind turbines. No birds were affected or Martians destroyed in the making of this, as environmentalists such as myself were involved throughout. It has helped to meet 20, the 2020 government target of 20% of the UK's power coming from the wind, so we think it's worth it. We used to dispose of most of our rubbish in landfill sites, Nowadays, most of our waste is recycled and we collect the methane from the minimal amount which makes it to the landfill site. The methane is used to generate power for local homes and industries in mini power stations on the landfill sites. Also, instead of bottle banks, we take bottles back to the shop where they are washed and reused, which saves energy taken to melt and remake the glass. The River Severn Estuary Tidal Barrage construction is finally complete. 10% of the UK's power needs are met by it, and it's going to last for about 50 years. The tidal barrage can be closed to prevent flooding, and even better, it only took six months for the carbon payback. After wind energy projects were completed, the government's taxes have moved to wave power. With Great Britain being an island surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea, we can expect there to be almost constant and strong waves throughout the year. Out at sea, there are wave farms containing technologies such as the sea snakes and the sea dragons. Also dotted around the coast of the UK are sea limpets, look like rocks but are quite efficient in producing electricity. Current predictions of the future of the peak district have shown that large areas of land will be lost. Even optimistic predictions show large areas cultivated for farming and flattened for housing. If we do lose the peat, what else do we lose? What we lose is a massive selection of flora and fauna that is already endangered. We lose money bought in from tourism and we lose the wilderness that surrounds us. If we are to protect the moorland for tomorrow, we must preserve it today. Currently, we estimate that 80% of our moorlands in the UK are damaged and have suffered from past drainage, wildfire or uh, bad management. And my vision, our vision as IEC and UK peatland programme, would be to restore them and bring them into good health so that they can deliver the services for carbon and biodiversity and water, um, as well as breathing spaces for people. Um, for uh, generations to come and especially that all the kids who are taking part in Mickey can enjoy them with their kids as well. And what I'd like to see is that the, the natural habitats of the Peak District, be they the blanket bog, the heathlands, the woodlands, 
are all in a really healthy condition for their, their biodiversity. Um, so my vision is really of a very healthy environment. But in getting there, it's also about engagement with people. So again, this doesn't, these moors don't just happen, they need to be managed. So it's about how we work as landowners, such as National Trust, with, with the farming tenants and with other land managers and with all the sort of myriad user groups, whether they're ramblers or cyclists or um, horse riders or whatever, working together with these user groups to help deliver that, that vision. So it's about an end point, but it's also about how you get there. Uh, I think, broadly speaking, uh, there are two uh, different types of future that we are likely to see in uh, moorland landscapes. Uh, the first is really a continuation of current trends, which is about us using these landscapes uh, less, less intensively, uh, putting less sheep on the landscape, for example, and managing them for the carbon that's locked up in the soil and to enhance the wildlife that is there. Uh, the other scenario that we think um, is perhaps not quite so likely but entirely feasible uh, is actually the reverse of that, which is about using these environments more intensively. Uh, you may say, well, that's not really that likely, but imagine a future where due to climate change, uh, you have a contracted land area, uh, there's less land to grow crops, uh, expanding middle classes in India and China, eating more meat, uh, far more people in the planet demanding food to eat, less food to go around. In future, might UK society, might the UK government prioritise self-sufficiency in food? And if we did that, what would that mean for the way in which we use our upland landscapes? Would that mean that we would start to put more sheep back on the hills? Would we start to put cattle back on the hills as well? And might we even consider uh, cultivating some upland valleys for arable crops perhaps, or even for biofuels, as we have con increasing concerns over energy con security in future. I'm really glad that this has gone now for several years already, and that so many kids have participated, and that it has already attracted quite a lot of attention, um, not only in the Peak District, but nationally.